Mm. And we're live. Welcome, Sam, for the round two. <laughs> so the first thing that I wanted to ask you about was you had your Arsamarata meeting in Bucharest fairly recently, right? It was a few months ago. Um, you had your meetup. Yeah, well, we have a, a conference that we do. Twice yeah. A year. We've been doing it for like 15 or more years. Mm -hmm. um, and it's for our membership. It's for our Amirati members. We have members called the Amirati. So we yeah. usually have 60, 70 people show up. Uh, a little slower after, during the pandemic, of course, and mm -hmm. after. But we do it twice a year. So we just did that one the end of September. Next one's the yeah. end of May. Yeah, yeah, in Bucharest. Yeah, because I was thinking of coming over. I was in... Uh... I was in um, Serbia around at the same time, so I was That's thinking great. of coming over to Bucharest. But the, unfortunately, this time the timelines did not did not serve me well. But how yeah. was it? How's how's everything going with your with your sort of tribe, your community? Well, it's really powerful. I mean, we've got like I said, we have had members for at least there's some members that are members for 15 years. Yeah, and yeah. they're friends for you know all over the world. We've got hundreds of members, and so we do the conference. And we have a big party on Friday night and we bring all the girls that we know and it's a big bash. And then uh, um, we have, um, have speakers on Saturday and Sunday. So we have a big and it's free for members. We do it all. You know, we've been doing it for many years. We used to move it around to Las Vegas, Warsaw, mm -hmm. uh, Valencia. Um, and then we just kind of said, you know what? We like it here in Bucharest and, you know, there's a lot of energy here and a lot of it's our spiritual home. So we just keep the conferences here. So we get a lot of people that have attended every single one for the last 15 years, twice a year. It. And we had, uh, surprisingly, from the old uh, 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 seduction community days, the pickup artist days mm -hmm. uh, at, this, at our party at this last Friday in, uh, in September, um, we had a surprise guest drop in and say, hello, I haven't seen him in years. And that's mystery. Oh, really? Mystery and, and Baxter dropped into the party and they oh, spent the weekend and they joined our conference and, and I haven't seen him in those guys in years. So it was a kind of a blast from the past. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so for those that aren't actually familiar with that, like what is uh, the Amar, what is the Ars Amarata and what is, the sort of focus there. What is the cohesive gel that that brings you all together? Okay. And yeah, I mean, like uh, it's a, it's it's from it's a group of men. The Amirati is a group of men mm -hmm. that are gathered around the Ars Amirata philosophy. And Ars Amirata is fake Latin for the art of love, the art of recovery, the art of you know uh, living beautifully. Yeah. And uh, the philosophy and the thesis is that beauty is above all in other words we've turned our face away from beauty in this modern age uh in relationships in uh in politics in community and we, we just in art and architecture and uh we've turned our face away from beauty and beauty is 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 something that we're all longing for that's mm -hmm. very concisely put into a very concise nutshell but the idea is that is that uh I just alluded to mystery in the old pickup artist days and seduction community days. There was a whole uh, movement that your listeners will certainly understand and, and are aware of that started over 20 years ago, which is this pickup artist ide ideology. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the intention was strong and the, and, and the, the idea was sincere, but it went down the road of manipulation and how to get a girl in bed and these three easy moves and this whole thing. And so, uh, so it's it's uh, our th whole thing for 20 years, ours and Marotta for 20 years has been this idea that you don't have to manipulate or lie or be inauthentic. Yeah. You can still have the, the, the honesty and the respect and the kindness and the curiosity and the invitation and be a scoundrel and a horn dog and, you know, have this kind of dirty, dangerous mindset that men need to have to, their masculine edge. So. So we have a, these guys that, that are members of the Amirati are the ones who embrace that I ideology and say, yeah, I want to live my life according to that. I want to live. I want to I want to have respect and kindness and curiosity and all these beautiful things. But I also want to let the world know that I'm a man and I love that I'm a man and I want to bend the world over. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. And when you say sort of trying to 
I suppose, like refined beauty since the world has turned its its face away from beauty. Yeah. What, is there any particular kind of time in history that you're looking back to? Obviously, the kind of the ancient Greeks and the Romans are one that would stand out in my mind as people that yes. value the Greeks, particularly who valued beauty in thought as well as beauty That's manifest right. in nature. So is there any particular time period from history that you're looking back to and trying to sort of relive or reimagine? Well, you're nailing it exactly correct. I mean, the Greeks had, you know, truth, uh, beauty, and goodness as the three ideals, mm -hmm. the fundamental things that we need to aspire to. You know, Plato's talks about, you know, the, the higher forms. And beauty was a guiding light for centuries. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, a, a, it was, a, it was a truth like truth and it was a truth like goodness. And so it was for 1500 years, 16, 1700 years, beauty was, you know, maybe even up to the romantic poets, beauty was like Shelley and, and, you know, this kind of stuff. Beauty was prime. And then in the last 100, 125 years, we've cast it aside. We've tossed it away in a uh, prime example would be art. You know, art is now made to shock. It used to be to, to impart beauty upon the world and to show some, to make us think transcendent things and to, and to contemplate beauty invites contemplation. And when you toss it away and you, and you, you put a shark in a tank and call it art or you shit in a can and call it art, you know, this kind of stuff, then it's all about the artist and how can I shock you and how can I, you know, and, and so our thesis is that, um, the beauty has been an ideal and has been a real, uh, a, a real physical thing is in physics. Mm. Like I believe that that beauty, whatever, you know, when, when the universe began, whether it was the big bang or a prime mover, something sparked it or started it, something at that moment when it boom and started to expand, uh, beauty was born as a, as a, as a strata, as a layer. And yeah. so I think that beauty, you know, we, we don't need to, uh, beauty exists, whether we, whether we see it or not, we've turned our face from it. So we don't see it anymore, uh, in general. And so the idea is to restore beauty as a primary thing in, in our, in front of our eyes and our mind. That's why politics is broken. That's why there's anger in, in the discourse of the world. That's why is because we've, we've, we've cast aside the transcendent element of beauty. So, yeah. yeah. There's this, there's this quote um, that I've forgotten who it's from, but it, it essentially goes that um, good times create weak men, weak men create bad times, bad times create strong men, Correct. strength, strong men create good times, good times create weak men. So there's this sort of illusion throughout a lot of philosophy that the world is cyclical. And as Correct. times pass, for example, we've got the ancient Greeks and then uh, you know, maybe 500 BC or onwards. And then in the 1500s, we have the Renaissance, 14, 15, 1600s, we have the Renaissance again, That's which right. was almost like a re-turning our face back to beauty and trying to recapture that. Do you think that it's cyclical to the extent that we're expecting now to see another turning of our collective yes. face towards beauty in the future? Do you think that it's sort of that Greek yeah. idea of things being predetermined to follow a certain pattern and we're likely to turn back towards beauty soon or now? I, I really do think so. I think that um, there's a book called For, uh, Fourth Turning or The Fourth Turning, Fourth Turning. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, the idea that you can go back to the, you know, to the 1400s till now and every generation negates and rejects the, the, the ideals of their parents. Yeah. So, so if you, for instance, go to World War II, there was a can do like we won the war we come back and we're like and now everybody's optimistic there's an optimism in in america I'm, I'm talking western culture of course right yeah there's an optimism and everybody's got a house and a chicken in every pot and the whole thing and then the children of that perfect quote unquote you know picket fence stepford wives type of uh uh everything's all perfect because it wasn't all perfect you yeah. know even though it looked perfect they rejected it and became the 60s freewheeling hippies and you know 70s and this kind of stuff and they rejected mm -hmm. that picket fence and they burned their bras and they tossed everything aside and then the 80s rejected their parents who were a bunch of hippies and yeah. said no we're consumers yeah and the 80s was all about consuming and consumers of that and so uh, the generations kind of like rejected 
I think the generation that is sprouting now after which the, there's millennium, then there's Gen Z, right? Yeah, I think, I think uh, yeah, that's right. right. I think that we've come to the end of this, um, this generational feeling of it's all about me, entitlement, uh, self-help, uh, self medic or, or medication, medication, resolve my childhood, all these things of therapeutic mm -hmm. looking inward, navel gazing. And I think the children that are, that are rising now are going to reject that say, no, you, you know, you, you, you saddled us with, with, uh, we can't buy houses. Uh, we, you know, we, the economy's ruined, uh, the government's just is ruined. And so we're going to fix that. I think you're going to get a can do generation again. And the fourth mm -hmm. turning would, would allude to that. So I do think yeah. that there's going to, and not only that, but we're so digital now. And especially with this new thing with the, the, the chat GPT, oh, which is that's one of the topics is, that I've got to talk with you about I, remarkable. You so early. I love it. I, I think, I don't think the general public knows yet the extent of what just was born on this earth. And I really do think that, I mean, this is like the early dial up days, you know, <laughs> for, for sure. Anybody says, "Oh, it can't. It's it, it's not authentic, and it and, and it makes mistakes." Uh huh. Is this is the early dial-up days? I really think that I, I've been predicting in my own YouTube channel. I've been doing a, a YouTube series with Jordan, you know, like about mm -hmm. for the last two years, and I've been predicting that something's going to hit the earth that's going to really magnify. And I think this Chat GPT and this AI and this 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 whatever it grows into. Is is going to be as big a change as the invention of photography, or maybe even the printing press? My, it's that it's, big. Zan, I was ha I was actually having this exact conversation with my with my video guy yesterday, and he's basically shifted his whole career towards focusing on Jack yep. GPT. He does his storyboarding for other clients with it. He creates animated yeah. videos using Chat GPT uh, scripts, and he uses Dolly, which is the text the image. image image version, yeah. to create the thumbnails and to create the animations it's it's i agree like I, we're having the same conversation it seems like this is the greatest technological introduction uh of a since the internet generation like since the internet was for sure I, I i'm convinced of it and we we're only scraping the beginning of it and it, like i said the public is not aware of it yet but i really do think that this is monumental and yeah. so in in the light of all that we're so internet based and digitized and online and ai um, there is going to be a turning, turning, uh, a, a desire to turn back to, to something analog in relationships in our hearts. You know, like if you think about it, we've had online dating for 20 years. We've had Tinder for f f what, 10, 15 years, right? Yeah. 50, yeah. Primary yeah. dating app, Tinder. And we've had three years of lockdown. Mm -hmm. So we've got an entire, uh, a, generation has come of age in the last 15 years that didn't that never ever experienced walking up to a girl on the street or in a bar straightening their tie and going say hi uh i'd like to get to know you or i'd like to get your phone number they're bypassing with the digital side so those secret or they're not secret but those arts of analog meeting girls for instance is, is going to be something that is a premium People are going to want it, and, and women and want women and men are going to say, "Yeah, I, I, I'm done with Tinder, and I'm done with all these online stuff, and and the AI optimizing my profile. <laughs> I would like to meet somebody for real in real real life, and that is a dying art. It's it's you know nobody's nobody's needing to experience that now. So I think there's going to be a real desire to go back to meeting people in the you know on your own terms. Yeah, I I I really hope that's the case, and I I believe that. That is the case. I was having this sort of conversation with myself recently about, um, you know, I have so many guys that I now talk to who say, like, I just don't see any of the type of women that I like in the world. Right. Still. Like, I don't see the types of women that are truly feminine and focused on just what they enjoy doing and in touch with them, themselves. And yeah. it's very difficult to put to explain the feminine. Right. We kind of have to wax poetical in order to capture any type of essence of the feminine you can't describe it you know descriptively and and um and clearly like that but the the the, the very funny thing is that it's like okay well where are you looking for these women and it's like oh okay well 
online, right? It's like if you're watching these YouTube channels and these Instagram profiles and these TikTok posts, and you're trying to find the types of women that you're looking for there, the types of women that you're looking for, you've predefined as the women that aren't there. So they exist, but you've got to go into these settings. You have to go to the spaces and the environments where the types of women that don't have 10K plus followers on Instagram are going to be. And that's where you're going to find the types of women that you're interested in. Because the vast majority of the guys that I work with, truly, they're not looking for Instagram models. They want just like a nice, easygoing, kind of simple uh, woman, right? And well, they want a simple life themselves, right? They don't want to yeah. have to like posture and and put on a show you know, either. Yeah, exactly. 100%. So I just want to come back before I lose that strand that we were okay. we were talking about we were talking about earlier with, with regards to sort of the digital age and and losing contact with with beauty perhaps in the digital age. I hope that you're right in that with all of this kind of technological evolution, people decide to turn towards the more analog and traditional style of actually just meeting people in the real world. Yeah. But do you think there's potential for this to be a sort of it's evolving so fast, the digital age, technology, AI, that we almost lose all contact with the analog age before we're able to turn back. How do we stop this from being a sort of a snowball rolling down a hill to the point where it's it's very hard to even find the analog version? I don't think you can. I don't think you can stop it now. <coughs> I think it's cats out of the bag, you know? Mm-hmm. And I, in, instead of trying to roll back to the good old days, which it never was the good old days. It's like, how can we use the technology and how can we use, how can we be authentic in a technological age? That's, that's the, the idea and the question, you know? Yeah, that is the and question. so, because it's not going to go back. Mm-hmm. You can say, well, you, you know, everybody, you know, and everybody that I know is I'm generalizing, but is saying, Oh, we need to buy some common property out in the wilderness and go back to the, you know, everybody wants to be, do yeah. this country living. Right. And go back to it, um, like the seventies when they all ran away from the draft. You know, the Americans all came up to Canada and they're buying property and living in hippie communes and stuff. You know, yeah. and that lasts five years, four years, and then you have conflict with your community members and somebody's ousted, and then people go their own ways and go back. But anyway, um, I don't know how it's going to. I do not know how we're going to with technology that's that's around us and not going away. How are we going to um, move back into, well, authenticity, which is a word that's overused and drained of meaning, but you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. In a technological age, because the technology is not going to go back. I like technology. I'm a futurist, you know, I, I, even though I'm from the forest and this kind of stuff, I think it's, you know, and maybe the world's going to be destroyed by AI, but at, at least we're here to see it. <laughs> at least we're going for the ride. So I don't know the future because you're not going to go. There, there was no good old days. We, we think of the good old days. There's an entire movement in the States and, and men going their own way, which is bring back the patriarchy and women should be yeah. barefoot and pregnant. Right. And, uh, and, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of honor and, and goodness in the idea of a patriarch, which is like the benevolent, king the benevolent father uh as opposed to the tyrant and the and you know and yeah. dominating and stomping around and so um so you're not going to go back to that to to that kind of era uh where the women can't vote and you know they can't even though some people want that uh it's not going to be that but it's going to be it's also what jordan peterson has been talking about that you know this equality is we didn't get it. I've been saying for years, we have sameness, but we don't have equality in all these equality, equality movements, you know? So I just don't know how it's going to, how it's going to roll out, but I am very optimistic for the future. I have a lot of faith in men, in young men. I really do. And I have a lot of faith in women. And, and I, and I, for some reason, I, my optimism never waned. I never get pessimistic. I never think, oh, it's terrible. You know, back in the, in the 20s and 30s, 1920 and 1930s, 1920 and 1930s of that, if they, if you asked them, you know, some to create the uh, image of the future, you'd see like the Jetsons, you know, like cars flying through the air and the images and, you know, like circ- spirals and all this kind of mm-hmm. stuff and cool futuristic villages. 
And now when we think of the future, we think of zombies and the apocalypse and, you know, yes. and the world's destroyed. It's all pessimistic. And uh, so I don't know. I'm optimistic. And I really do think that if we can recover our concept of beauty, which is a contemplative concept, beauty you can't hurry. It has to something that dawns on you. You know, if you see a painting or something that really moves you, it has a quality of dawning on you. And it takes time and that that's in contemplation and, and, the, and the slowing down in contemplation in a technological world, I think is fantastic. I think the combination is going to be fantastic and I don't know how good it looks. Yeah, no, that's, that's, I agree with all of that. I, um, every year, at the start of the year, I do Jordan Peterson's future authoring program where it gives yeah. you a chance to sort of visualize how you want your future to be. And it asks some very sort of, introspective questions about what your goals are why they're important are they for you or for someone else you know really digging into what it is that you want and each year the first goal that i always put and i never think about this in advance but it's always to be to come back to presence it's always to say i need right. to spend more of my waking hours in a state of awareness of awareness right so in a state where i'm aware that i can actually see hear, and feel everything around me because I believe yeah. that that is sort of the starting point from which every other goal can arise and yeah. can only have any meaning if it does arise from that space. Like every memory you have from your past, every positive memory, every one of the best memories from your life has to have been born from a state of like present awareness of what's going on. Otherwise, it doesn't have the character of being positive or memorable. It has to come from a place of, That's right. of, of presence, right? So my question to you would be how can what is the most immediate way if we take beauty as the, the, the sort of example again how can we most immediately connect or reconnect with beauty if you're a man and you're frustrated and you're anxious and you're overwhelmed as so many young men are today what is the most immediate way that they can reconnect with beauty well i think that if we reconnect to hmm, we're so surrounded by self-help in this modern age and if we throw all that aside and go back to um, the stories of the, of, of that, that created us, in other words, the, the stories and the myths and the legends that the classics, I guess you could say, classics of literature, for, for instance, I think, I think literature and reading, you know, these types of books as opposed to self-help is a way better. Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, I read the autobiography of ben, Benvenuto Cellini when I was young, and I read Casanova's memoirs, and I and I was dirt poor, and I was beat up, and I was in in a in a dismal childhood, but so were they, yeah, and they just said, you know what? Okay, well that sucks. I'm out of here. See ya. And they go out and create a life of adventure. And so, what excuse do I have? How can I sit there and think, well, I need therapy before I can meet girls? Or I need to resolve my childhood before I can be a, a, a competent adult. You know, I think it's this the symptom of our modern age. So I think the immediate thing that, that men can do is go back to the contemplation of the arts and literature and 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 contemplating a beauty, whatever that means to you. Go travel. You know, leave your you know, the Bible says that Abraham left his father he, and, 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 and the Lord said, go to a new land that I will show you. You have to go. You have to leave your father's house and go. Mm -hmm. So go in and, uh, and see what you're made of, you know? And uh, I know that obviously somebody might be in prison and they can't do that, but you can certainly go to explorations in your mind and go back to what, what created our cities and our culture and go back and read these things, you know, and, and, and steep yourself in, 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 the masterworks that came before us because that's the culture that's handed down to us. Yeah. That's, you know, that's handed down from father to son. This is how you hold an ax. This is a symphony. I'm going to teach you about a symphony son. This is a sonnet. This is Shakespeare's sonnets. I'm going to show this to you. So you get the sense of, of what created our culture and created our, our cities coming down to you today. So um, yeah, I think uh, the immediate thing is I think men need to get off of the, Definitely get off of the news. Does you used to ask for a practical, immediate mm -hmm. uh, advice on, on how to, to change this. Get away from the news. Quit doom scrolling through your phone. Yeah. First thing in the morning is what we do, right? We grab our phone. 
start scrolling through and see what's what's and 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 back away from all that and uh and contemplate contemplate the, the concept of beauty in other words a beautiful what does your life look like if it would be beautiful what would that a, a life of adventure and beauty what would it look like pause and take a moment to to consider that you know yeah so you you brought up two really interesting things there and you used the example of the father and i think that can both be seen as a sort of microcosm and a macrocosm on the one sense you have a sort of changing roles of a father where it's almost like the father no longer feels the responsibility to impart wisdom upon his children. And in a more macro sense, it's like the collective father father figure, the archetype of the father seems to be more and more lost. Like when we think about role models, like what voices do we really have to look to as someone that we can right. look up to as a man and say like, this is how I want to be. This is a sort of direction I can move in for the benefit of myself and for this, the, 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 cult, the culture as a whole. So, so my question there is, you know, we're talking about father figures in society. Do you believe in this sort of, let's say, slightly more conspiratorial view that the matrix or society at large is trying to destroy this archetype of the father figure? So do you think that is a causal relationship to what's happening where society is trying to do this? Or do you think it's more a symptom of a changing time and it's 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 not in any sense an attempt by society or uh, the people who run society to damage young men so that they cannot revolt, etc.? I think there is a target. I mean, I think it's targeted. I really do think that there's a an agenda to deconstruct, right? When, I mean, we're in the era of deconstructivism or whatever you, however you say it, right? Mm -hmm. Which is to tear down the institutions, to tear down the traditions, to tear down the um, the things that built us and made us made us into this incredible society that we have. So that's why statues are being torn down, and everybody's you know in the past was a slave owner owner now, so they're tossed out, and everybody was a, a you know a, a misogynist, and so they're tossed out, and it's canceling all the history of all these 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 men and women that created something. So I do think that there's there's this progressive idea that you need to tear down institutions and traditions and replace it. The problem is they offer nothing to replace it with. So we tear down the 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 Western canon of literature, for instance. This you know toss it out. Shakespeare is canceled. All this kind of stuff, but they they offer nothing in replacement. They just want to destroy. It. Yeah. And that's a very strong thing, and it's a very strong element. And they they offer no remedy. It's, it's exactly just, what happened. In, yeah, it's exactly what happened in Nazi Germany and in in Stalinist Russia as well. It was public book burnings, just get rid of it. written yeah. history, and replacement with one simplified doctrine that had a number right. of rules that you had to to stick to. And education and history were both rewritten simultaneously. The education system right. and the history were rewritten, and so it, yeah, it is. It's, it's so I do think yeah, I do think that institutions and universities and uh, media are inf are inf infested. I do, mm -hmm. I really do. Yeah, take I, it however you want. Take it however you want. I really do think that that someone who is coming of age and thinking of going to university should think out think otherwise that's what i think yeah that's that's my my recommendations as well <laughs> Let's go go travel go like uh you know invent something invent yeah. a, invent a path invent a life because the institutions and the media and uh, i think it's in i really think it's it's uh it needs some mental fumigation because it's infected infested yeah so are there any male voices that you think today are truly important? Well, you know, I, yeah, like I think, I think someone like Jordan Peterson has a, the problem with Jordan Peterson, and if Jordan Peterson hears this, this is my allusion to where it goes astray for him, is that he's trying to fight this Medusa in other words, he's wading into the center of the swamp and he's fighting, you know, all these cutting off one head and they're all growing around him and there's no winning. 
and it's destroying his health. His book and his message of, of clean your room and, and straighten up and, 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 and recover some order out of chaos uh, is a beautiful message for young men and they've responded to it. Young men around the world have responded to his message, but where it goes astray is when he's trying to fight these, these scre screeching voices that you cannot win. And, is, and it, it, in fact, it destroys your health. So ours are Murata, our whole philosophy is to talk to young men too and talk about the goodness and, you know, and alignment of being men and growing into that path, which is a good thing, similar to, to uh, Jordan Peterson's message, but go around the modern discourse, the social media discourse, the media, go around it, ignore those screeching voices that are saying men are toxic and, you know, and all this kind of stuff that are trying to cancel Jordan Peterson. I just heard that the, the, the Toronto board of psychologists or the, on the Canadian board mm -hmm. of psychologists is having a vote to, to remove his psychology degree or his license. Yeah. Just, just because they don't like him. Yeah. So they're, they're asking him to be, to re-educate himself. He now has to go right, in and, yeah. and take a re-education uh, thing, which he's refusing to do. At peril. Uh, if you don't, here's the peril. And I, and I tell you, he should, if Jordan Peterson just concentrated on his message that's beautiful and give that message to the world and, and let the young men, men and women receive it and, and, and write his books and this kind of stuff, and not listening to those voices and not going to debate and trying to say, convince and, and override their, their, because you cannot win. You cannot win. No, I'm, I couldn't agree more. I think it's part of the, the kind of hero's journey is that you start with a great message, you get your platform, and then you get reeled into this online sphere, which is Twitter mm -hmm. and the woke left and, and everything, all of this sort of milestone of modern ideas kind of sucks yeah. you in and makes you feel, it, it almost radicalizes you to this position of feeling like you have to fight when really it's like there's this quicksand in front of you and you don't have to walk through it you and you don't have to walk through it your way out you can go around it as you, you said can around, you can, yeah you can just navigate or speak from the place before the quicksand you don't need to enter that but it almost pulls you in i think yeah because we're trying to say okay well the world's broken so we need to be on a on a crusade on a mission uh, and, and be warriors and go and fight the good fight but it's a swamp and so it, it there's there's no sense you walk around it and the few you know narrow is the path to righteousness you know and so the few will follow around and the rest will go into the middle and get eaten up and and, and beat up and discouraged and depressed and become incels and, 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 you know, school shootings, it's all in the center. It's all, it's all in the center. We walk around it and uh, say, no, we're, we, we're not going to listen to these voices and listen to this discourse. There's something better, which is a, re, which is a, we're seeking beauty. So why would you walk into the swamp? Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's, that's like first principle thinking, right? It's like, if you go back to what am I doing here? What is my project? What is my mission? I'm pursuing beauty. Then that can be a sort of navigation system. And it yeah. sort of relates what you said to the tearing down of the institutions without some written word telling us how we can live righteously or to live well. And with no other option, people lose their direction. And so you, you can kind it. of see beauty as a religion to that extent where it's that's like, correct. if that's your guiding principle, you will avoid many of the trappings that people fall into because you have that first principle to return to, which gives you a path. Exactly. So we've, we've stripped away religion from our consciousness and move to science and technology and and nietzsche said you know you, you do this at your peril i mean like he said god is dead and and he was a staunch atheist he doesn't believe in god but what he was saying was he was saying basically the the phrase is god is dead he will remain dead and we have killed him that's what nietzsche actually said and what he's basically saying is you take god and religion out of modern society good luck because you have nothing to base morality on Mm. You have nothing to base, uh, you know, right and wrong on. And, and so you're at peril. And so we're feeling that today because we've stripped out, like you said, we have nothing to fall back on, nothing to, no guiding light. And so my thesis and the thesis of Ars Amrata is absent religion from everything. You don't have to go back to religious ideas, but beauty is physics 
beauty is a, is is an electromagnetic field, I guess you could say, and it is real, and it is a it is a it is a a founding principle. And it, in other words, beauty is a guiding light. If it's not beautiful, don't go toward it. You know, and so so beauty is my religion, and it's like it's beauty becomes the guiding light that centers us and gives us. Uh, it gives us moral purpose and gives us a reason to live and gives us a direction and a way we want to it, it comport our lives sort of thing, right? So yeah. that's right. We've, we've stripped away religion and, you know, things like the Bible and the Torah and the stuff, you know, and that, that were a basis of our, of our society and we've replaced it with nothing. We replaced it with science and technology and science and technology just the whole basis of science of technology is to go faster better harder deeper it's just it's just to keep ascending yeah and there's no you know at the expense of any individual transcendent thought or whatever it's, it's just go let's make make it build it faster and bigger and so and there's no contemplation in technology it's just go go yeah. go go yeah it's like an elevator that's moving increasingly fast but what's important is the con is the content of that elevator. What are we elevating? Right. And if technology is elevating banal mundanity as opposed to something of real value and Correct. goodness, then it doesn't matter how fast and how high the elevator goes. If it's carrying bullshit, it's yeah. irrelevant. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, we talk about things like the the quote unquote the nuclear family. I mean, there's 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 a reason that animal groups are, are constructed the way they are. And there's a way that human groups are constructed the way they are because we need each other and we need community and we need family and element, that element. And even that is being stripped apart and saying, you know, you don't need that. Yeah. It's, it's an outdated patriarchal uh, imperialistic system. And, and so the family is being attacked, which is not right because, you know, uh, and, and I'm not saying that, I mean, uh, there's all kinds of permutations and com in, in combinations of, of of that. But for centuries in all cultures, you have the, the man and the woman and the children. It's the way it's always been, you know. And we, we, we rip that apart at our peril. Yeah. We really do. I think that this is something, I mean, it's so interesting for me because I've always been someone who's... Um, I, you know, I love nature and I have a very, very strong attachment to nature, but I've always been a city person. Like I've always wanted to be at the center of the world. I've wanted to be in the place where I feel most at the center of everything that's going on. And so I, I'm very much in the city mindset. I, I'm very exposed to all of these ideas that, you know, with media and what's going on in contemporary yeah, Western me too. world. Me too. But as soon as I go back for Christmas to my sister's house. She lives in the, the depths of the English countryside in an old <laughs> historical village with mummers, with these old traditions started by Edward III. Wow. And a community of people that come together for any event that's suggested in the village, uh, you know, with a, 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 a fiancé and, and old traditional values in pristine countryside. And whenever I go back there, it is like a parallel universe. It's literally like a piece of history that's that's been lost and everyone knows each other in the village and everyone talks and everyone is kind to one another and it's this sort of beautiful uh this beautiful thing so it's interesting when we were talking earlier about well there's no way to stop this train now but is there in a sense maybe you can't stop the train but can you just get off at the side of the the road and build your house do you think there is some value to the idea of just saying well maybe i can't stop it but I can still just live on my own terms and, and move out of this system. Yeah. I think, I think that whew, because can you live a life of quiet contemplation as Aristotle said, he said that was the only life worth living one of quiet contemplation, right? Can you do that in this heart of the city? Um, or do you need to, uh, to go back to a bucolic setting? which is getting more and rare, more rare to be able to go to. Right. I mean, like, uh, I, that's a good question. Cause I very much live in the center of the cities too. Yeah. And, and when I was a kid, I would grew up in the North and I grew up in the forest and I grew up, you know, with no electricity, running water for all my, all my youth. 
and had a rifle with me and I had a knife and, you know, and I, and I had moccasins on my feet and I, I lived like a native. I, I, my neighbors were the natives and my friends were the natives, you know. I learned how to speak Cree to a degree and I learned how to write Cree, believe it or not. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, how to make things out of birch bark and how to, you know, do this kind of stuff. Again, I loved, 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 loved the wilderness. I was a wilderness kid. I know how to survive in the wilderness. But I came out of there because there's no girls. <laughs> when yep. I was like 18, 19, wait a minute, there's no girls out here. I got to go and find some girls. And, I, and, and ever since then, I've been in the cities of the world. But is it different? That's the question. Is it uh, because I do feel I'm in my studio right now which is, in the, I'm in the dead center heart of Bucharest. Like, if you ever know Bucharest at all, there's the center of the city, which is the walking streets. I'm right in there. Yeah. And I have an apartment with Deanna, a four-minute walk north of here. But I spend all my days in my studio. I have a rocking chair. I've, I've got my books. I've got my hats. I'm surrounded by, you know, my guitar. And I sit here and I contemplate and think and wonder. And I can spend the rest of my day sitting here writing and thinking and so did i lose something because it's not in the forest i don't know you have to create your i think i think you have to because we're going to be surrounded by technology in cities no matter what we do yeah so you could either run to the forest which i'm very much at home in but i'm very much at home in the city too because i like i like social energy you know i like to 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 break bread with you and you come to town i want to i want yeah. to see i want to to have the option to spill out into the streets. You know, I, I need that. I want that. Yeah. And at the same time, I can cloister myself away in a, in a quiet place in my rocking chair and sit and contemplate. So yeah. Yeah. You, you, you create it where you, it's, it's internal, I think. I think this journey to the wilderness is really in a journey into our internal self, which is if anybody's on a seeking journey, which I have been for all these years and which you're on, Mm -hmm. And anybody who's listening to this is, is on or they wouldn't be listening to it. You're a seeker of life. You want to know. You, you want to, to move towards excellence. You want to move towards more adventure. You want to move towards more mystique and magic in your life. That's, and there's a lot of people that don't. They just consume. They just eat and, you know, uh, uh, get Botox and watch Netflix and, 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 and just try and get consumerism. You know, they just want to, they just exist. And they don't contemplate and they don't uh, have introspection. If you have that at all, you're a seeker, which anybody who's listening to this certainly is. And you continue that for all of your days. You would come to equilibrium. You, you must. You will never find an answer, but you'll come to feeling like, wow, you know, I spent my days in contemplation. Contemplation. I can look back for the last 10 years, 20 years. And, and, and it's been quite a ride. And, and, and I'm very pleased even though I'm, I still don't have this and this and this, and I still don't understand all these things, your journey, you look back and think, man, at least I did that. And at least I tried. At yeah. least I can do that. So that's cool. Yeah. You, you mentioned maybe in one of our previous conversations or maybe in, in your book, it, it's something about not being able to resist the call to adventure. And I think that a lot of men it's not I, I, some people have this perspective of like oh you know five percent of men will go on to lead amazing lives and everyone else is happy in quiet mediocrity but actually i don't think anyone's happy that i think inside men there is always this spirit of knowing that there is a cool inside of them it's why the hero's journey yeah. exists you know this this idea uh, the Jungian archetypes and the, and the hero's journey which was a sort of extension of of, of some of that that we all see, we all understand the story of Hercules and what it looked like to be the boy that goes on the mission and goes through perils and, sure. and comes back. So I, I think that for a lot of people, it's like they've become so institutionalized in a state of resistance, like resisting that call to adventure that they almost don't notice the suffocation anymore, you know? Yes. Yeah. It's yeah, comfort yeah. in a state of suffocation because you... You don't remember what it's like to accept that cooling to adventure. Let's but say. everybody gets a twinge of it. You know, every time your birthday comes yeah. around, yeah. you get your birthday. Everybody's celebrating and, and your friends are there and your family and they're singing happy birthday and stuff. And they're giving you a card and a birthday card and stuff. And internally, you feel turmoil because you feel like, man, a year flew by. Yeah. And now I'm a year older and I didn't do all the things I wanted to do. I didn't do all my resolutions I said I was going to do. 
Mm. You know, so you get this twinge, this ang- ang- anxiety, this angst in us every time a birthday comes around or the summer flies by and it's already winter again. Yeah. And we feel this internal, uh, eternal angst about our existence, which is, you know, the fear of death and the whole thing. And, um, and, and that's where this, it, it's a never present thing. And so, but most of us ignore it and we, and we, we, sanitize it with you know distractions like drugs or alcohol or you know occupying our time we fill up our other time with all these different classes and different things so that we're we feel like we're actually you know not uh being stagnant so it, yeah it's cer- certainly it's the existential angst of our soul and it's not new but i think um you come to an equilibrium at some point, not a resolution, but you come to an equilibrium and think, you know what? At least I'm sure trying. At least I'm, I'm damn well. At least I'm I'm doing my best. At least I did all those crazy adventures and nothing worked out. I At least I in, tried to make that business work and it failed and I lost all my money. But at least I tried. You yeah. Know? And in starting that business, I mean, it's easy to think you started the business to make money or to do this thing. But really, I think what we're always seeking is the psychological changes that we know will accompany the money or the success that we make it's like it's not the money that we want That's it's correct. the knowledge that we have the mind that was always capable of making that money or that success and so very often even if someone fails monetarily in their business they get the psychological change they faced something difficult they took the risk they went through the adventure and even if they don't come out of it as hercules yeah. the the leader of a a, a nation or, or whatever they come out of it having learned, having gone through that and having the psychological state that they were looking for. Yeah, at, least we, at least we can say, I, tr- I did my damnedest, man. I stood on this earth. I yeah. stood on this earth and I, and, I, and, I, and I tried to make it work. And if, and, you know, it's like Rudyard Kipling's poem, if, if, you can, if you can put it all on, all your fortune on, on one roll of the dice, you know? read that poem guys it's uh it's if you can do these kinds of things and push yourself to the edge and and say at least i tried yeah at least i did my damnedest you'll be a man you know yeah what's more you'll be a man my son there you go (laughs) so zan i i want to i i know that you love bucharest and i love bucharest as well and i loved uh i love coming and visiting you earlier in the year what is it about Bucharest that to you is so special? And for someone who's a seeker of beauty, yeah, what, what drew you to Bucharest above all others? Well, that's a really good question. And let me just, um, I was traveling for 15 years, one carry on bag only one pair of shoes and hitting the road and mm-hmm. living for three months in Montreal, three months in Panama, three months in South Africa. I just wandered. Right. And, uh, and I always had this wanderlust in me. And I can't. I got to Romania, and for some reason, that wanderlust drained away from me. And I think it's because people say, "Oh, you're from Vancouver." Well, Vancouver is such a beautiful city. Yeah, if you like, you know, rollerblading and rock climbing, and which I'm not that guy, you know. <laughs> you know? If you like the outdoorsy type of energy and wearing hiking boots, uh, you're gonna you're gonna love it. But I like the nightlife. I like electricity. I like uh, coffee culture. You know, I like this socializing and and talking about art and moving through that kind of thing. So I got to Romania and, and my DNA is here, by the way, because I did a 23 and me test. I knew my father was Ukrainian. Uh, my grand my grandparents came from Ukraine to Canada. Mm. And my father was born in Canada. I was born in Canada. But I did the 23 and Me test, and my DNA on my father's side forever has been on the border of Romania and Ukraine. Wow. So my DNA is here. Damn. And I, you know, and I, everything about it, it, it's, it, it, it draws me to it. There's something about this, this country that makes me smile when I land at the airport. I'm not kidding. Yeah. And it's full, of the, it's full of the type of women that I find beautiful. That's the truth. You know, I think I like I like Romanian girls. I like their their spirit. I like their the way they look. Uh, I like brunettes. <laughs> so there's a lot of brunettes. And I just like it. Romania is like what Canada was like when I was a kid. You could ride your bike without a helmet. You could, you know, 
you could do stuff. Yeah. And in, in Canada now, it's all regulations and shut down. And a, a good example, I was at the beach last summer here, and they have a beautiful beach on the Black Sea here, a number of beaches in the Black Sea. And I was out there in this resort laying on in the beach chair and, I, and looking around at all the people, and everybody's there and, and having fun. And I saw this family a little ways from me. And here's a, a little girl playing in the sand, and her mother is sitting on the chair and playing with her. And the father, his young father, is laying back and in in looking at the sea and watching this little girl play. And he's got a Heineken, a can of beer. He's drinking a Heineken. In Canada, he'd have a fine. They'd, they'd take his beer, uh, you know. And I'm thinking, where else can a young father with his family drink? I don't even drink beer drink a cold beer then on a hot day on the beach where you, you know where where else can you do something I didn't there's no public drunkenness but yeah. it's so regulated and shut down that oh no that's it's this skull they have these skulls in Canada you can't do that you can't do that's what that's what's attacking Jordan Peterson you yeah. must say these pronouns you you're compelled compelled speech you must do this it, Jordan Peterson's rebelling against what what you know Canada has become now what it used to be is what Romania feels like to be so that's a long-winded answer no that's it's 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 a much more beautiful way of expressing what I already sensed would be the case just to note Rio de Janeiro you certainly can drink a bottle of cold beer on the beach with your family around I know okay. we were doing that last week so and you should be able to yeah no 100 percent. Right? I think that's uh it's an interesting thing about places like Romania, maybe I, I felt the same thing in Serbia, actually, when I was in, uh, when I was staying in Belgrade. But uh, it, it's almost the sense that they don't need to be so strict on the laws, because there is some sort of traditional ethic running Correct. through the veins of society that says, right. you will not attack someone on the street. If someone yeah. walks past you wearing a nice watch, you, you don't need a law to tell you not to take it. Yeah. You're a Christian nation and you, you believe in being good and that's important and you're not going to do that. And when you show up to the presidential, to that huge palace in the center of Bucharest, you're not going to litter on the floor or set off fireworks yeah. or do something. You're, you're just, it doesn't even cross your mind to do so. You know, when I was in London every single day in my part of Canary Wharf, and I, I love London actually, but every single day I, I witnessed robbery of the shops. Every single day exactly. I watched people shoplift and the staff can't do anything about it. And it's like they've lost to an extent the internal sense that I will not rob because stealing is wrong. Yeah. And that's why they need so many rules and laws. Whereas in Romania, I, I, I sense that it's, it's, it's very yeah. much like you just don't do that. It's remarkable because in Canada, in all my years going out to bars, I went out three, four nights a week to bars for years by myself trying to figure out girls, right? Every single night, there was a fight. Mm. Almost every, in, in England too, right? Like, yeah. uh, there's, the men are aggressive and want to fight because they're pissed off at the world and there's no girls or whatever, they get drunk. Um, and the other thing that you, that you see is public drunkenness people vomiting or drunk driving event. You don't see that in Romania. You don't see that. You, everyone's drinking. Yeah. Everyone's having drinks of that, but you don't, they take care of their own. It's like, you don't see public drunkenness. You don't see male aggression. You don't see this, this, you're talking to a girl and the guy comes up, wants to fight you. You don't have that. Mm -hmm. You rarely see any kind of, uh, you know, bar fight or aggression here, which is remarkable. And, and public drunkenness, you don't see it. When, when I'm traveling with Deanna, we go to England, go to London, for instance, and you, 11 o'clock at night, you see the girls with their heels in their hand, sloppy drunk, slurring, blah, 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 blah. Is it America, Canada? You know, I'm generalizing. Sorry if you're from that country. But um, you it's don't not visible see in Eastern Europe, is it? It's not visible in, in Bel Belgrade or, or Romania or anywhere. Uh, around hey, there. there's, no, there's no violent crime. The city of, of, of Bucharest is 2 million people. Yeah. And there's zero, and I'm not saying little, I'm saying there's zero violent crime. Yeah. There was one murder in the 10 years I've been here that I know of. So it's a completely different culture, isn't it? Yeah. So Zam, I didn't know if I was gonna bring this topic in and I haven't discussed this with you before, um, the, the, this podcast. So if you don't wanna talk about it, I get it completely, but 
I thought I would kind of have to seeing it's everything that's going on. Andrew Tate, did you ever cross paths and never cross to... paths with this guy? I, I only heard about him in the last year mm -hmm. because it became all over the, you know, the, the, the consciousness of everybody. And, and people started asking me about it. And I was in Florida recently, went to a conference there and all the guys were saying, Hey, do you must know Andrew Tate? Because he lives there. No, I've never crossed paths with him, never corresponded with him. I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. I don't even I've never even seen any of his his content. But I, my understanding is that it's pretty, you know, uh, kind of like Dan Bilzerian, which is like, you know, uh, strong men and, and keep women. I don't know. So I have no comment on it at all, but I've never, and he just got arrested here, apparently. Yes. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I won't go into that. I think you're actually in quite a, I, I, this is not my, I think actually his message is good. And I think he's net positive. Okay. That's my personal opinion. I think he's net positive on the world because I think, Men have responded in a way that shows that, they, that they're becoming proactive. They're fascinated by him as an individual. They're motivated by what he's doing. But, you know, it, he's of a, clearly a controversial figure. It's just interesting because he started teaching men about women as well. And he does events all over Bucharest. Yeah. So I was just, I was curious. No, to I've know never, never crossed paths or seen any, or I've never heard anybody here that knows him. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know, and and I think he's in trouble right now because yeah, you know once once you get attacked by the uh, the powers that be, the Matrix, you know um, he's he's in trouble because they're going to nail him with some stuff. I think unless he's yeah, got then, some lawyers. Zan, it's so interesting. I'm not going to go deep into it, but it's so so interesting. So he was arrested on accounts of human trafficking and potential tax fraud as well. The human trafficking is the line they followed. Apparently, there were six victims. Uh, only one of them gave an account and the victim that gave the account, there's zero evidence for what she's suggesting happened. Two yeah. of the victims have come forward and said, he's been my best friend for 10 years. I, I'm not a victim. Oh. I've lived with him for nine years. Two of the victims, yeah. their identities are unknown and apparently they've left the country so they can't be interviewed. So it does look a lot like a Matrix attack yeah but they could you know it, and, and maybe it is benign and maybe he he's he's innocent i have no clue but he he's got some stacked forces against him yes like, of course. And, and, yeah. and they'll find something against him you know to try and yeah if nothing else he'd be kicked out of the country no i know my, my suspicion is that it's pressure from the u.s i think it might be pressure yeah, from yeah. the romanian government for the u.s combined with the fact that he converted to Islam recently. And I know that Romania oh, wow. is the, the most Christian nation in the world per capita. So it might be some sort of uh, combination. Oh, yeah, I didn't know that any of this. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I, I, I'm very, yeah. I think we're in a very privileged position not to know anything about him, <laughs> not because I think he's bad, but because it just shows that you're not spending any time on TikTok, which is a, a very good life decision. Um, yeah. I don't, I, yeah. Yeah. I don't have, I have a Twitter account that I had since the beginning, since Twitter started, I had it at Zan Perion. And mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, I deleted the account. I thought, you know, I, I, don't know it's, I just don't like it. I think it's toxic, yeah. right? And so I deleted the account and I just reopened the account again. I just created it again, got my handle back again, which is surprising, but I've got like three followers and I just started just to, as a placeholder, really. Mm. No, since I love, months, you don't I know would love to be your fourth people. follower, but I, I, I <laughs> Twitter is the one thing that I've managed to abstain from, and I, I, I think yeah. I will continue to do so for the moment. I've never really posted on Twitter. I just had the account. Anytime something comes along, like TikTok or something, I create an account just in case it becomes yeah. the new Facebook, and you know you need to connect with people or becomes like a good thing. I don't know. So I create a placeholder account. And I just sit on it and and. That, uh, yeah. That's, That's the best way. It's like learn the technology, understand what the technology is without being trapped in the addictive cycle that it's going to inevitably drag you in if you if you actually participate. Exactly. It's the best way. Uh, before we close this off, I like to keep the people wanting more and to uh, guarantee a follow up <laughs> at the people's request. But before we, we close up on this, um, this is more for selfish reasons. How's your book coming along? I I, I Genuinely well, not anticipating anything to read more than the release of your book, whenever that may be. You might do a doctor yeah. direct on us and, and, and leave it another 10 years. But what's the, the situation? Well, like last year, like last fall and stuff, I was traveling and doing some speaking and visiting my family. And 
And so there's all kinds of things that kind of just impinged upon my productivity. Mm -hmm. And I came back after uh, I was in California and Canada for the month of November. And then I came back here in December and then it's my birthday and then it's Christmas and, you know, that sort of thing. And then New Year's. After New Year's, I said, you know what, I'm going to unplug me from the social flow and just hide in my studio and do the minimal things like this. And, I'm, and, I, and I just, I eat one meal a day, you know, in the evening. I have my coffee in the morning and I, and I sit in my rocking chair and I work on my book for a, a big chunk of the day as best I could. And it's, I'm progressing and I think... In my plan is, um, I'd say I'm about mm, half done. But if I sit here and crank at it every day, I can I can nail it pretty fast. I think. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I'm uh, I'm I'm heads down this this winter, and I'm not going to be doing a lot of things, and I'm not going to be traveling, and I'm just going to fight for this and and put in my hours every day and limp along. And uh, hate it every minute because <laughs> it's hard, it's a hard thing to do, mm -hmm. and uh, and hopefully um, this will be the year that I just I bang it out. Are so, there any um, spoiler alerts available in terms of how it's progressing? I don't want to say any. You told me a little bit about it, but I yeah. I'm not going to say any of that. Well, but I had a, Deanna was in my studio the other day, and we I I I've never shown it to anybody, but I'm going to show it to her by the end of this month. I made that commitment to show it to her because I need a, a bounce. I need a sounding board because the Alabaster girl came out of my experience and it came out and it's obviously something that I would, would like to have read when I was 20 or 19. Right. And, and it was, a, it felt like it was necessary because there's no message out in the world. That's like it, it felt it was necessary. This book I'm writing now is more a philosophical treatise on creative process and beauty and a white life well lived. Right. And I'm, in my hesitation or my head scratching is it doesn't have the or doesn't feel it or I'm trying to get into it the same urgency of impact that the Alabaster girl had was a message that I felt needed to be in the world and my head scratcher in this one is does the world need this book <laughs> you know because it might be philosophically interesting but is it is it is it profoundly going to change the world I don't think so is it is it uh, something that people would be curious about? Maybe it's something that I would like to read. And I guess that's my only litmus test is, what, is it something yeah. that I would like to read? Then that, that's a, then that's a, you know, it's a, it's a good uh, choice. So I, it's, it's, um, um, I don't know how it's going to be received. I really don't know, but I'm going to do what I, what I see in my mind. And if I can capture what I see in my mind, the, the concept of this, what I'm trying to wrap my head around and what I'm trying to um, and the tone I'm trying to catch. If I can capture it, I'm good. Even if the whole world doesn't like it, I'm thinking at least I got that. I nailed what I tried to say, what I, what I can feel internally, what I'm trying to, what I try and articulate, you know? Yeah. I, so. I think to, for me, besides the message, which I found to be the best, the best and most clear positive message on this of anything that I've ever read was the alabaster girl. But besides that, I think the power of that book was in the narrator's voice and how it was sort of poetic because it was unclear whether this was the author <laughs> or a character. And it yeah. was sort of both at the same time. And the book was sort of just on a cloud. It was like reading it. It was like everything was floating on a cloud. It was just drifting through Right. Beauty. It was it was it wasn't quite grounded in reality, but at the same time it was talking about reality. Yeah. And it was it was it was like a long poem. It was just like a long poem. And I think that that's also what other people connect with. It's the same when you think about the Bible, when you think about that book, yeah. The Secret, when you think about the greatest salesman in the world, that book, and even coming back to things like the hero's journey, there's always this sense that they are a fundamental truth. They are a voice from a higher place right. that has been somehow translated into human language. And I think one of the great successes of that book was it managed the very, very rare feat of feeling ethereal, right? Wow. And not 
feeling like a, a book of yeah. this earth, but feeling like it was a voice from somewhere else. Is the second book, yeah. is there some sort of poetic nature? For to sure. The- I mean, like, it's the only way I can construct myself. My, I, if I just wrote a book of essays, there's no big deal. I could whip it out. I could say, mm-hmm. you know, for instance, if I wrote the Alabaster Girl to my young self and said, hey, young man, here's what you're doing, here's what you should do, and here's what women are thinking, blah, blah, blah. I could write this practical book, which would be yeah. like a third of the length of the Alabaster Girl. But the medium is the message. Yeah. The the, the way the, the, the musicality of the sentences give you the, is, is part of the message that the sentence is saying. Yeah. And so, so this, the hardest part for me with the Alabaster Girl was the, the, the point of view. Who's writing to who? Mm-hmm. When I first started to write it as like maybe a, an old guy to a young guy. But it just, I couldn't, I, I wrote that like that for a couple of years. And I had, eventually I changed it to a man writing to women. Because now, he, now he can speak authentically and tell you that here's here's the secrets that you're gonna, you might not agree, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. Yeah. So that's how that all came about. It was the voice that I had a hard time with, and the second book, it's the same thing too. It's the voice, who's speaking to who, and what is, and and what I what I'm dead set against is any any hint of self help in it. Yeah. Or, you know, like uh, or preaching. I'm not gonna preach mm-hmm. and, and say oh, blah blah blah. So in other words, just like the Alabaster Girl, this is a book of illusions. I'm alluding to something, an idea that may be true, but maybe not. But I think it's, I think it's valid as opposed to saying this is the way it is. And if you want your life to be, to, to be better, you smarten up and listen yeah. to what I say because I'm the guru. Yeah. You know? It's and condescending, I, isn't it? That you manage yeah. with the Alabaster Girl to impart wisdom without in any way telling your audience what they should think. Correct. It, it, and that is how that is the the best yeah. movies are not the ones where they're obviously telling you how you should think. They're the ones where they're they're telling you what they think, and in so doing, it's the most persuasive. Yeah, because uh, you can contemplate and reflect it onto yourself. So the alabaster girl, somebody can see themselves in that guy that is on the train, right? Mm-hmm. And what I'm doing now is I'm writing the same th- type of thing, and I just want to write a. A que- right around all these topics as opposed to saying here's the truth the ultimate truth that i've learned in you know all my years so it's a difficult thing but i've i'm capturing the tone i feel and uh i'm doing the the best i can and if i like it at the end um then i'll be happy even if other people say well that that book kind of useless or it's too poetic or it's no practical or what you know okay i can live with that you know, so yeah. I'm reading uh, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius at the moment. Uh-huh. I, it was very interesting to learn that he never wrote the meditation. He didn't call the meditations, first of all. Uh-huh. And sources uh, suggest that he would have hated that name for his, uh-huh. his thing. For him, it was a spiritual exercise. So he's writing the same point over and over again with a slightly different framing and context as a spiritual exercise. For himself. For himself, he never yeah. intended it to be read by anyone else. It's not That's a journal, right. nor is it a diary. It's a spiritual exercise in 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 exactly what you're talking about in contemplation of how to live, lead a good life, and what to prioritize. And so, it's interesting when you're saying, you know, you sort of don't know who the audience is, or you, you don't know maybe where that voice is that was in the Alabaster Girl, and what voice is in this one. It's just an interesting thought as I'm reading that one that he didn't actually intend it to be read or point. anyone. Yeah. It was purely a spiritual exercise in and of itself. But I, I, yeah, uh, I just, it's kind of like that way for me. Like I, I'm really writing this. Uh, I'm writing something that I wish I could read. Yeah. That's my whole point. That I wish I could, that would catch my attention and make me want to read to the next page and next page. And so, yeah, that's cool. So. I'll see how it lands. It's going to be different and interesting. And it's a, of course, it's a, it's not a plain narrative. It's like a, and it's, it's a, the Alabaster goes like the movie Inception There's layers in it, you know, and this has got yeah. layers too. So, cause I don't know how else to do it. <laughs> I'm insane. If I just wrote it out, banged it out, 120 page book, 20, you know, 20 page book, I, I could do it, but there's something that is missing in the, the flow if it doesn't sound like music, yeah, it's got to have that. It's got to have a, a lilt. It's got to have a, a swinging quality to it, a 
as you read oh, it, you, you're, you're lulled by it. You're, you're, you're rocked by this book, you know, it has hypnotized, hypnotized as well. Yeah. It, it's, it's yeah. like you're in another world when you're inside the pages of that book. Um, yeah. So this, this leads us nicely onto my final question. So you titled your book, The Alabaster Girl, which uh, some, somewhat captures that pristine image of perfect femininity that is uh, collective, but is also unique to each, each man. If sure. your Alabaster Girl was to write a book about Zan Perion, <laughs> what do you think would be the title? Oh my goodness. What would be the title? She wrote a book about me, for instance, right? Or, yeah, the Alabaster Girl. Um, after, after getting that book, she she wants to write a book about Zan Perion. What does she call it? Oh my goodness! Uh, you don't have to have an answer. You can come that's back. That's a tough one. Yeah, that's a tough one because um, you know. We talk a lot about self-help and how we, we get wrapped up in self-help. I, I, I don't want to mm -hmm. digress too much here, but the idea of your future self, like I, I have this concept in my course, in the Amorati course, um, where you uh, uh, exercise you do every day. You sit in, at the end of your bed in the morning and you, and you stay quiet and you think about your life and who you are as a man, what you want in this life, and you contemplate your future self, say 30 years from now. So you, for instance, imagine yourself 30 years from now. Where are you standing on this earth? What are you, what are you, what are you wearing? What's your hair look like? What, uh, you know, uh, who are you with? Who are you surrounding? What are you doing in your day? You know? And you, you really start to envision that future self of you um, as if it was real. And you become friends with that future self because that's a cool guy. Yeah. That's somebody. And then when you have a decision to make, a fork in the road, should I, should I take this job or should I do this instead? Uh, you ask your future self, future self, what did you do back 30 years ago that got you to where you are there? That cool guy that I see now, what did you do? That's your best guide. And so I contemplate my future self all the time and I can see myself. And, and, and so I'm thinking that something that would be titled in my book would be something about that guy that I see as a cool guy in the future, an old guy in the future that I would like to hang out with. It's a cool guy to know, you know? Yeah, my future self. So that's a good question. I have to think about it. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I, wa I wanted that to be. I wanted that to be difficult. I, I just like I was trying to think of the the most interesting kind. Yeah, of the interesting. And I'm going to ask Deanna that too. What she would call a book about me? <sighs> that's interesting. Okay, so that can be the first question on our next uh, podcast. There you go. What Perfect. is the name of that book? That's perfect. <laughs> awesome. Okay, Zan. So just so everyone can find you, uh, why don't you just like tell everyone your links? I've done some low okay. promotion of your channel in my uh, community posts. I wrote a book called The Alabaster Girl. You can buy it. Go to alabastergirl.com. Alabastergirl.com because I, I give away a book as a gift from me. For, I, I sign it, send it from Romania. You just have to pay for the cost of the book and the shipping. And I'll send it to you. If you and I'll sign it for you and I'll send it to you um, or go to Amazon, get it. It's a Kindle. The audiobook is about to be uploaded, too, by the way. Mm -hmm. So it's on the way. And uh, my website is arzamorata.com, A-R-S-A-M-O-R-A-T-A.com or zanperion.com. And you can find me there. I have a course. We have an Amorati membership. You come join our members. You would love it. Um, be part of that crowd that comes around every, you know, every six months and comes into Bucharest and we have a celebration. We have members all over the world. You become a member, you have somebody pick up at every airport, wherever you go and it becomes your friends. So I think that's it. I'm easy to find. I'm on social media. I'm on YouTube. Look at our YouTube channel. Um, I guess that's about, yeah, that's my links, right? That's it. That's it. I, I just want to get... I want to very briefly come back and say that I asked you about who you think are some of the most important voices. I think, um, I think your voice is still missing from, uh, I know you do your things on YouTube, but I think it, your voice is incredibly necessary right now. Appreciate that. Appreciate um, that. Yeah. 
And I, I just appreciate you being around, man, and keeping doing what you're doing. It, it genuinely is a source of um, like personal power for me to know that you're still thinking about this stuff. There are certain people in the world that you really would miss on a fundamental level if they weren't mm -hmm. there. And for me, you you are one of those very, very few figures. So appreciate I really that a lot, appreciate you, brother. And I I'm really very much that. looking forward to to the new book and to catching up in uh in sunny bucharest in thank in you so summer. much yeah come come visit come when you when you when you when you come to town let me know yeah i um i i'm i'm turning into this kind of element where i'm at a rocking chair now and i'm kind of mm -hmm. like sitting around and in my and surrounding myself with books and i'm not this itinerant traveler anymore and because i had no teachers growing up you know i had no teachers yeah and um i had no men to look up to so um, I don't know. There's there, there's a shift in me that's happening right now. That's going into this contemplative mode of writing and thinking and sitting in my rocking chair a lot. I can feel it. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, my future well, self. Is uh, yeah, I'm looking for. I'm sure everyone else. I'm looking forward to hearing the thoughts that come from that that rocking chair. Uh, as well. <laughs> so, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna nail it. I'm gonna bang on it every day, guys. And, awesome. Uh, and uh, and hopefully it'll be out sooner than we think. Good stuff. Oh, yeah. My offer remains open if you ever, not that you need me to do that, but if you ever want someone to read the second audio book, I am volunteering myself to. to <laughs> That's a deal, man. <laughs> okay. Deal. All right, Sam. All right, guys. Thanks so much for coming. And Thanks for having me you. again. Always a pleasure, man. Bye-bye. Yeah, good work, man. Thank you, boy. Thank you.